So if you're just getting into crypto, uh, it's probably not a good idea to start with active trading, like day trading. Um, that being said, uh, one of the best ways to invest in crypto long term, and this is not financial advice, uh, is just to DCA or dollar cost average into something like a crypto index fund and then regularly take some profit when the market is overbought. This podcast is co-presented by EasyDex. Right now, it's difficult to navigate the world of decentralized finance or DeFi. That's why EasyDex is rolling out a series of solutions to make finding and managing the best DeFi products as easy as just taking out your phone. Check out EasyDex now. Hey guys, this is Lance and you're listening to Project Offbeat. Here at the show, we like to highlight people who chose offbeat careers, right? People who've pursued paths that are not your usual corporate path. And as always with me is my buddy uh, who loves good convos as much as I do, Matt. Hello, right? hello, hello. So Matt, you know, today's episode is a special one, right? We've partnered with EasyDex Exchange, an up and coming crypto exchange to talk about the world of cryptocurrency. A lot of us find this field to be intimidating, to say the least, right? How yeah, crypto yeah. is very volatile, high risk, high reward environment, right? Where many people, while they have succeeded, tripled their their you know their capital and all, many people have also lost millions in a night. How it's not regulated by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas in the Philippines, and even more so for some, it's the sheer unfamiliarity in the space. It's a very new thing right now, at least in the Philippines, right? Uh, I think mm-hmm. the rise only started this 2021. What in the world is crypto? DeFi, NFTs, is this just another fad or, you know, is it the next big thing, you know, in the internet economy, right? And you hear also Mm -hmm. a lot of good stories in the Philippines, right? With the rise of play to earn games like Axie Infinity, even the people that do not have jobs right now are able to earn small incomes, right? And maybe those small incomes are already enough to put food on the table for their families, And I think that's what's something that's very nice in the Philippines right now. People are earning in this Axie Infinity game, right? And it's very customer-centric because, you know, they mentioned that in the crypto world, the transactions, you know, won't have to go through centralized institutions like banks, financial institutions, and all the other rest, right? So, you know, in, in a sense, one of our bigger problems in the Philippines is inequality, right? And with this DeFi, right, with this world of crypto, is it a chance to, you know, uh, nullify or even lessen the inequalities here in the Philippines where the rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer? Because there's so many questions in this space, especially here in the Philippines. And although you hear about it endlessly now, not a lot uh, went into this path yet, um, you know, to try and take it on. There's still a lot of fear there. It's why we're so glad to have partnered with EasyDex for this episode. In Project Offbeat, we want to talk about people who have taken the hashtag off the beaten path in hopes of expanding perspectives and answering uh, the curiosity and questions of our fellow working Pinoys. And there's no other guest that's more fitting today than Robert Van Patten, EasyDex CMO or more foundly known as a crypto expert. Robert's path was surely offbeat because he loved learning languages and writing. He, he first started humbly as a translator for companies like Alibaba. He even has a blog where he jots down his thoughts. Then he jumped into the crypto space and started an, an exchange along with his crew. Now he's advocating passionately about the education of crypto. Talk about <laughs> jumping careers. It's right. so varied. <laughs> Matt, you know what? We had such a long intro. Uh, but it you know, is, without further ado... Why don't we welcome Robert Van Patten to the show? We're hyped that he's here with us today. Robert, I'm doing welcome well. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. <laughs> welcome to the show, Robert. Welcome to the Thank show. You. Thank you. All right. Uh, why don't we get it off and running, right? First and foremost, Robert, uh, we'd just like to ask you, how, you know, how did you even get into the crypto space, right? Matt was just saying earlier how your careers were so diverse from a translator and whatnot. How did you even, you know, end up in this crypto space? Tell us about your journey um, uh, as, a, as a person and as a crypto enthusiast. Yeah, sure. So um, thanks again for having me on the Offbeat podcast. So it's kind of a long story. Uh, yeah, my name is Robert. I'm the CMO for the decentralized exchange called EasyDex out of Taiwan. Uh, to give some background of, you know, about how I got to where I am today uh, in university uh, in the United States, I studied Chinese history, culture and literature. That was my major. So I've read a lot of Chinese works like Confucius and, and others. 
uh, originally out of university, I was interested in doing translation, like freelance translation. And uh, my wife is actually from Taiwan. So when I graduated, I went back to Taiwan with her and started working here. Um, so when I started, I was just doing translation for companies like Alibaba, Xiaomi, Reuters International, probably a couple other companies that you may have heard of. Uh, that was that was cool. Um, and I think especially doing stuff for Alibaba, you kind of got an inside look into a lot of the stuff that they were innovating over there. Um, but anyway, I was just trying to you know make a living doing something that uh, you know didn't exactly have the the time constraints of the nine to five. Which you know I, I had worked nine to five jobs before. You know I've worked any kind of job that you can imagine, like an you know, outsider, whatever else. You know before when I was younger, and I wanted to find something you know outside of that to do. And I thought translation was probably the best bet for uh, where I was at in my education. And you know one of the things about uh, you know when you're doing uh, this kind of job freelancing is you're essentially trading the nine to five for being your own boss. Uh, and you know unless you have experience being your own boss. Most of the time, it's not so fun. Uh, I think. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I think, especially uh, with freelance work like freelance translation, unless you're uh, consistently marketing and getting yourself out there, emailing potential clients, um, you know, whether that be direct clients or translation agencies or whatever, you're basically in this uh, feast or famine loop of work, and it's it's not very healthy. So striking a balance is important, uh, but it's hard. So, uh, so I tried to strike a balance actually by joining some, some business organizations where I am in Taiwan. Uh, you know, it's important for uh, doing some kind of freelance work or remote work that you're able to still uh, get out of the house and meet with other people in a meaningful way. Um, so anyway, I joined a couple of business organizations like uh, the American Chamber of Commerce. I looked at uh, JCI, which is like an international chamber of commerce for uh, young people, like people aged 18 to 40. I looked at Toastmasters, Rotary, and also BNI or Business Network International. Uh, now, all, the, all of those organizations are fine if you're looking at, at, at joining one of them, you know, if you're doing freelance work or something like that, it's, it's fine. But I like BNI the most. Um, so I've been in BNI for about three years in Taiwan. And, and at one point I was even the president of a chapter here, which is pretty strange because in East Asian society, it's typically pretty closed, but I guess they just, they just liked me. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I should... I don't know. Anyway, I really like BNI because of the structure and networking training that they give you. Uh, they really teach you what works in networking and what doesn't, and also how to be consistent, which is very important. Um, that's one thing that's really hard when you're freelancing and also networking and marketing is to be consistent. It's very easy to just kind of you know hustle and, and try to work out uh, you know getting getting clients for maybe a week and then you burn out. But you have to be consistent. Um, and so you know there there are things you're doing every week, for example. Uh, with BNI to, to increase your networking influence and also getting closer to those key clients. So it was very helpful. The first time I, I, I even knew anything at all about crypto uh, was in 2013. I had a couple of friends uh, who were building computers just to mine Bitcoin. And you know, at the time I thought they were kind of crazy because, and maybe they were crazy, but anyway, at, at the time I think Bitcoin was something around hundred US dollars per Bitcoin. Um, and, wow. also, yeah, yeah. and, wow. and, you know, recently Bitcoin went as high as I think like, you know, 64,000 or something. So that, exactly. Yeah. And almost no one had ever heard of it at the time. I think also everyone was saying people were using Bitcoin for nefarious things and it seems uh, sketchy at worst and a dubious investment at best, you know, at that time. Um, anyway, they started to explain to me, uh, just about Bitcoin, what it is and the kind of problems it solves. Uh, but I didn't do anything with it at the time. I was just focused on studying and other things. And it was basically like, well, if this thing really is that important, I'll check it out later, which, uh, you know, I think is probably most people's perspective on it, you know, even now. But yeah, it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't until 2018 that I, I really started to look into uh, Bitcoin and crypto again. And uh, at that time, the crypto market was still in the chill of a very long bear market. Uh, but anyway, uh, I started doing my own research, looking at projects, things like that. Uh, but I didn't invest that much at all in it, just mostly just watching and trying to learn. Um, it wasn't until 2019 that I started getting more involved with crypto, uh, co-founding co a crypto-related startup, um, not easy at X, uh, to help educate people about crypto and also provide a, a safer way to invest in crypto through indexing, basically creating an index fund for, for crypto. Um, but it, and it was actually when I was working on that startup that the founder of the company I'm working for now, EasyDex, 
uh, sort of pulled me out and asked me to help him with their project. And that's where I am now. No, actually, it's the first time I've ever heard of like an index fund for crypto. Yeah, that's a very unique idea. Well, it was unique uh, when we started. Now, I think there are several projects, which is good because in my opinion, probably one of the safest uh, ways that also has a high level of uh, accessibility for most people to benefit from the crypto trend is just putting a, like a little bit away each month in something like an index. Um, and then so that's fun. Yeah. Thankfully, there are a lot of products now. When we started, there weren't. There was maybe one. Robert, I think you mentioned earlier in your trajectory, right? In, in such a, a diverse trajectory coming from Alibaba and whatnot. You yeah. mentioned in 2018 or in 2019, you started looking again into the crypto world, right? Yes. Um, you started 2013, but five years after, you looked into it again. Was there any specific moment that made you look um, at crypto in those specific years? Was there like a bubble or was there like a, a you know, uprise of, um, I don't know, a phenomenon for Bitcoin and all the other crypto space? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, Lance. Um, I, think, I think I had just started reading more and more on, on social media like Twitter about people writing about Bitcoin specifically and how, uh, you know, different uh, large organizations like maybe Amazon were going to adopt it, something like that. I don't think they ended up doing that. But now you see large social media companies like, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook very yeah. heavily adopting crypto, uh, things like yep, NFT, yep. profile picture, verification, et cetera. Uh, but at that time, it was mostly just people, you know, kind of writing about uh, large companies looking at adopting this technology. Robert, earlier we mentioned that Yes, in the probably in Taiwan and all the other Western countries out there, cryptocurrency is like all the hype right now, right? Even Twitters and all the mega companies are already adapting it. But in the Philippines, right, where we're deemed as a third world country, right, and we're mostly um, lagging behind in terms of these things, right, uh, in terms of technology and even internet, you know, connectivity for a lot of people, right? So may I ask you, um, given this, you know, there's a lot of misinformation, lack of an awareness out there for the common Filipino. How would you explain crypto to the common Filipino? Yeah, sure. Uh, so before we really get into a discussion about, let's say, what crypto is, uh, it's best to make a distinction here between virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies. So virtual currencies are like the currencies you might encounter in a traditional video game. Uh, maybe you use real world money to buy the in-game currency or you earn it in the game through quests or challenges or whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, the head programmer can essentially just push a button and make more of that currency or take away your in-game currency or do whatever they want with it. Uh, you can't do that with Bitcoin. Bitcoin essentially solves the problem of having a currency that is native to the internet. Uh, for example, where the supply of the currency cannot be manipulated. The only way to get Bitcoin is by participating in what's called the Bitcoin network. So there's a network of thousands and thousands of computers running around the clock, verifying transactions and solving very difficult math problems in order to mine Bitcoin. That is, once a computer solves the problem for the current block and the answer is verified by the, the other computers on the network, then that computer is awarded some Bitcoin as a reward for essentially keeping the network safe and verifying transactions. Um, it's very difficult to hack this network. Um, how difficult? Well, you would need probably more computing power than 50% of the current network in order to do what's called just a double spend. <laughs> okay, wait, so, wait, before we, before we like advance, right? Mm -hmm. What is mining? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so mining is, is just a word for the, the process that, you know, the computers on the Bitcoin network go through in order yeah. to verify the transactions and then add them to the ledger. So like the universal ledger of uh, Bitcoin transactions. So once you add up, you're basically figuring out what that block is like the, mm -hmm. and the transactions to put inside of it. And then you add it to the last block. And then once it's added, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of sealed off each block. So you can't go back. You can't go back and change. It's immutable. I see. Okay. I right. think it's, it's, it's because of that difficult process of mining. That's why, you know, the coins are very, very limited. Right. Right. I think Bitcoin, mm -hmm. Uh, how many supplies are there? Bitcoin? Like, there will only I think, ever be 21 million Bitcoin. 21 million for the entirety, right? Yeah, so it's, I think that's it's like why, a finite supply. But right, it's right. because you can divide one Bitcoin to, I believe, yeah. eight, eight places out beyond the decimal. And uh, I believe that number was chosen because I think it, it, it represented um, something like uh, how much money each person would need with that amount of you know spaces beyond the decimal for the current global mon like money supply, something like that. I mean, because if it's like $62,000 per coin right now, I mean, 
I, I'm not even sure if uh, how many percent of people can buy a coin uh, fully, right? Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Sorry, you were mentioning earlier about virtual and, and cryptocurrency, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned the difference between how virtual currencies, you can just uh, manipulate them and multiply them uh, by any programmer out there. Right. And for uh, cryptocurrency, you mentioned about double spending. So, mm -hmm. um, so is this not possible? For example, what if Mark Zuckerberg, you know, mentions to Facebook that, hey, I want to make it, you know, to the point that I can hack uh, Bitcoin and, and, mm -hmm. and its network. Is it possible that, you know, he <laughs> double spends it or whatnot? So that he can multiply the Bitcoin supply out yeah, there. Yeah. So I mean, if you if you were able to you know marshal the funds and resources to try to uh, get more than fifty percent share of the Bitcoin network, you could try. But all that would result in is your ability to uh, double spend what Bitcoin you already have. You won't be able to steal from other people, and all you're doing is basically when you do the double spend, all you're doing is forking the current blockchain. So you can imagine the blockchain like a train. It's going, 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 going. And instead of moving forward, it's moving forward by adding train cars in front of itself. And so when a double spend, basically you're forking into two different trains. There's train A, which is the real Bitcoin, and train B, which is the fake Bitcoin, which you're using to double spend to try to trick the network to spend the same Bitcoin two times. That's all you can do. You can't do anything else. All right. And then, uh, so thank you. Thank you for that. I think it, it kind of helps us uh, you know, see why it's so valuable today, uh, the, the concept of crypto and these coins, right? Um, you're also, I think, um, working on a crypto exchange right now, right? Which is right. EasyDex, right? Um, how does it feel like, right? For example, if I want to trade coins and all, right? Do I have to, you know, work in an exchange first? Or what's the difference between people working in an exchange and those that are, like us who are just, you know, regular traders. Um, do you guys have an advantage in terms of knowledge in the market, knowing which coin to invest in or, you know, not really like that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, uh, given the nature of my job, I'm probably researching, you know, Monday through Friday, probably about five projects a day in the space. So wow. that does give me an advantage, but that's not an advantage I have from working, let's say for this company, anyone can go do it. Um, so there's, there's that. I mean, most of, the, uh, most of the inequality right now in crypto is essentially an, an information gap. But I feel like probably 70, 80% of the information out there that you would need in order to do well in the space is publicly available if you know where to look. There are a lot of people on social media, especially Twitter, uh, mm -hmm. that openly and publicly, you know, write about projects that they're looking, that they're looking at and linking to them and linking to papers on them. So, I mean, anyone, regardless if you're working in crypto or not, you know, you, you have the ability to, to go and research for yourself. Okay. Robert. So you mentioned, you know, uh, your, your, your job right now gives you the advantage because you're looking at, uh, five projects at a time or at the day, right? What do you mean by projects, right? Is it something that the regular commoner can also get into and research about? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, if, if you have the time and the inclination, you can definitely do this yourself. Um, the only problem uh, is that you need a certain amount of background information on the technology and the industry in order to do it. But you can get that. So, for example, I will send you guys a link for um, it's a site called like Crypto Skill Tree. It's essentially a skill tree of links uh, for working in crypto. But you don't mm. have to work in crypto or be interested in working in crypto for these links to help you. They can just help you to understand um, everything you need to know um, as far as ba basic information about the industry so that you can then take that information and go research projects by yourself. And what I mean by project is essentially there are different uh, teams building different solutions to different problems uh, in the space. Most of the problems uh, that projects are solving that I'm looking at are not on the technical end. There are, there are some most of the problems are not technical problems in that sense. They're much more a software problem. And what I mean by software problem, I mean an application problem, meaning that you have to figure out how applications work together and also how to keep them safe. And also what kind of you know, specific problems that you're solving. You mentioned, right? So you're working in an exchange and this is the advantage that you got, right? Uh, market research and all. We just want to know then specifically EasyDex, right? You're working at EasyDex Exchange right now. 
uh, what makes it different from you know the usual exchanges like uh, you know Binance or uh, maybe Toro or PDAX and whatnot? Um, can you share to us more about you know EasyDEX? So yeah, if you've heard of these centralized exchanges like like Binance or even you know eToro for stocks, um, you know one of the main problems with centralized exchanges is you're essentially giving them f- full autonomy of your assets. You know you're putting your money into the exchange uh, to buy assets on the exchange, but the assets still sit on the exchange; they're not in your wallet. And so, you know, what happens if the exchange goes down, or what happens if the exchange gets hacked? Um, you know, it's basically it's basically you just well you just lose your money. Sorry. You know, some of these uh, centralized exchanges do have, uh, you know, insurance funds, but is that going to be enough if, if hackers steal all the money, you know, in the company? So um, that's 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 one of the main differences is that with EasyDex, a decentralized exchange, you keep all of your money, all of your assets in your own wallet. And then whenever you want to do something uh, in decentralized finance, use a different uh, application or, or protocol or contract, all you do is interact with the exchange using your wallet. So you have full autonomy. You choose what you want to do and where your assets are. And so it's uh, much safer in comparison. So is it like a cryptocurrency wallet? Yeah, so we're developing our own cryptocurrency software wallet, but you can use any of the major um, software wallets that are already out there. So I I think in Asia, uh, one of the the best ones is I am token. So I am Mm -hmm. then T-O-K-E-N, I am token. Um, You can also use uh, MetaMask. MetaMask is very big, especially if you're using a, a desktop. So I am token is a software wallet on your phone. And then there's also Trust Wallet, which is big in the West. So you can use any of those, but we're also developing our own software wallet. I read in one of your blogs uh, that you you guys had a vision for EasyDex, right? I mean, yes, it is a crypto wallet and you know, it's also an exchange, right? Um, but you had a vision uh, and that's why you called it Easy. Easy, yes. easy to use or easy, easy decks, like easy as uh, uh, talk to us about, you know, how, how you guys built that vision, right? Uh, to be the, you know, easiest uh, crypto exchange out. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this kind of ties, ties into the, the why for, you know, why we're doing this and why I'm doing this. Um, you know, the, the principal re- reason why is, you know, we want it to make it easy for people to access uh, the best things that DeFi or decentralized finance has to offer. Uh, because, you know, right now it's, uh, it's really tough for someone who doesn't know much about crypto or DeFi to make the best use of what's out there. That's sad. So uh, if we can bring together the best that DeFi has to offer, aggregate it all in uh, one place where it's easy to use and manage, um, I think that'll be a very big help to most crypto users who don't have the time or inclination to spend tens or even hundreds of hours trying to figure out even just a couple of DeFi tools and how to use them. That's not fun. Um, well, it's kind of fun for us, but <laughs> probably not for most people. Uh, we want to make it easier for other people. Uh, and that's why we put in the name EasyDex. Uh, we want to be the easiest decentralized finance platform to use, but also with stellar DeFi products, not just basic stuff. Is it it right to assume that um, since your vision is easiest um, exchange, that's why you're now focusing on growth in the Philippines and the countries, you know, nearby like Southeast Asia? Because I think the barrier right now for our countries is, yeah, exactly that, right? There's lack of awareness, there's lack of knowledge. And there's the information. high fear, yeah, high fear and, and, and lack of information. Is that why you're, you guys are focusing into the Southeast Asian countries now? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're mostly out of Taiwan. Um, and so, you know, it's just, it's close for us. Uh, but, but really, you know, we're just, we're just trying to, uh, a lot of what we do is awareness and, and education, just, you know, trying to help people, you know, understand, you know, what, what, what problems these technologies are solving and you know, what, what problems these products are, are solving. And even if you if you never buy or use any of our products, that's okay. You know, if you if you uh, you know walk away from this podcast or even from interacting with our with our platform, having learned more about the space, I'll be very happy. So you're more like educating people so that they can get into crypto, even if they're not really using your products. You know, mm-hmm. just getting people into the into the crypto game. I, I would say probably eighty percent of of what uh, what we're doing, at least from like. You know the the mark the market side is is education and awareness, yeah. Because that's that's the number one hurdle for I think most people uh, going into the space by themselves is there is there is kind of a you know like a hesitation or or even a, a fear, but that's not necessary, especially if you uh, you know are just in it to to learn or you only use small amounts to kind of play around with different uh, products or protocols, yeah. Yeah, you know what? Definitely, because like I guess the the income level I guess is not as high as like other countries. 
that's why people are are a lot more you know are a lot more careful or cautious about where they put their money into um but i guess we're looking into this in in such a negative space because we talk a lot about how people are scared of getting into crypto or or don't have that much information but there's like a certain group of people in the Philippines that are into crypto, uh, are backing NFTs, are are backing like these blockchains and whatnot. Um, what would you say is like the fundamental fundamental human aspect that leads people to buy into this space? Before I answer that question, I should probably address uh, what is money. Oh, sure. <laughs> this is kind of a deep question, but I will try to simplify and, and not take so long on this. So there, there, are, there are basically two views of, uh, of money and they're, and they're both true. They're kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, so one, one view of money is uh, as it relates to energy. So money is energy usage. So money is essentially how many barrels of oil, right? Or fuel that, uh, that you use to, uh, let's say, support your style of life because all of that fuel goes into growing the food and also manufacturing, et cetera. So one side is, let's say, how much energy. Um, but that energy is also tied in with order, the creation of order. And the it's, it's somewhat abstract, but the, the very uh, obvious uh, application of that is things like software, right? You're essentially organizing uh, data and the organization of data is valuable, okay? And actually, that, 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 that actually is, in some sense, money. And that's what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is, is some, some, something like a, an abstracted out version of all of the energy and order that was, the, that was gone into the creation of the mining of each Bitcoin. So that's one half. The other half is the social aspect, uh, meaning that you know, I, I see theories of money uh, that they teach in school where it's essentially, oh, we started with barter, you know, like I trade this item for this item, and then we went to you know, precious metals. That's actually uh, false. As I read, we uh, before precious metals, it wasn't essentially barter. Barter has existed forever, but barter isn't money. Barter isn't money. Before we went to precious metals and other things like shells, for example, the, the Chinese used uh, shells, the Beka shell, for a very long time uh, before they switched to money. Everyone used different items. Before using that, the previous system of money was I remember what you did for me. We live in a small enough community, let's say 150 people or less, right? And so I don't have to have an, an outside physical counter of how much you did for me. I just remember. And so it's a reciprocity. So there's two sides to money. One is energy and created order, which is kind of like bit, Bitcoin represents that in a very pure form. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side, which is the social aspect, which is reciprocity where money is essentially uh, you know, a, a mark of how much you've done inside your community, right? It's like an objective measure of that. So they're kind of like together, those are the two sides of money. Um, so when you ask, you know, why would people you know, look into this space? It's because Bitcoin on one side, and then on the other side, Ethereum and all of these social things like NFTs and social tokens, mm -hmm. social tokens directly represent what money is. And they're interchangeable, you know, with, with people. There's there's almost no friction, right? Where so whereas before it's essentially okay, maybe I have to carry cash, or I, I I'm doing things with a bank, and it's very slow and it's very abstract in a way that is not helpful for me and does not directly benefit me when I when I help other people. Let's say if I if I create a social platform, and I create social tokens to where if you help someone, you get this much of a social token, you know, on the platform you can already very quickly benefit from things that you do on the internet to help people, for example. Whereas, you know, before that, you know, it, it's very, it's very hard to get, you know, real monetary, you know, wealth uh, to yourself, you know, with just cash. Right. And so you're basically taking what things, uh, what money already is taking it to its fr most friction, most frictionless form in the form of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, let's say mm -hmm. social, social yeah. funds. Right. And then making that available to everyone. I see. I see. Wow. Uh, Robert, I think that was an amazing uh, first half of the show. It was loaded and how, how we love you. You're not just talking about the crypto world. You're injecting all of your history and all of your, you know, your historical uh, views. And that's how we love it in this first half. Right. So, OK, I think we can take a short break. Thanks, guys.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, it's been a great first half with Robert uh, so far where he explained to us the world of crypto, where he's working at right now, EasyDex Exchange. And what is his why, right? What the, why is he doing this? Why is he preaching? He, he's doing 80% of his work in, in education and you know just building communities out there, right? So I think, um, Robert, for the next part of the episode, we want to do this for our listeners, right um what's in it for them right and all right so i think the first question and everyone's asking this right how does one actually get started into trading in crypto right is there a guidebook for it you know is there some safe ways to do it without you know shelling out all of your uh savings and whatnot how does one get started with this yeah sure it's a, it's a great question um it's a question I, I get a lot um, so if you're just getting into crypto, uh, it's probably not a good idea to start with active trading, like day trading. Um, that being said, uh, one of the best ways to invest in crypto long term, and this is not financial advice, uh, is just to DCA or dollar cost average into something like a crypto index fund. Um, so there are many products that can help you do this. Um, you could probably just Google crypto index fund, look through a couple, do your own research. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, invest just a couple percent, maybe, you know, three to 5% of uh, whatever money you have set aside to invest in crypto into the top 20 coins or so each month, and then regularly take some profit when the market is overbought. Um, you know, once, we're, once you're comfortable with that, uh, you could try dipping your toes into doing something like yield farming. Um, there are some great yield farming products uh, being, de being developed right now. Um, and we also have something of an educational YouTube channel, um, and we're creating content for that. So you can check it out if you want to learn more. You can also join our Discord server. Uh, I will sometimes post good projects I'm looking at. So uh, I guess a question here is, how do you know if a cryptocurrency is overbought? Because, you know, all of these cryptocurrencies, they're always um, marketing like, oh, we're, we're, we're going straight to the moon or shooting for the moon, yes. right? And they're always rising and stuff like that. How do you know if like, this is a good time to like leave or like to just stay or, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's a great question. So uh, how I judge overbought uh, is you look at the daily chart for a, for a specific coin, or, or you can look at, for example, just Bitcoin, the Bitcoin chart. Uh, yeah. If you want to, let's say sell, uh, you know, 20% of your whole portfolio, every time Bitcoin is overbought, you could just look at Bitcoin, the BTC slash USDT chart on trading view or whatever trading uh, chart software that you have, you'd use the daily chart. So uh, just look for D for the denomination of the chart. And whenever the RSI, so you look for an indicator called RSI, uh, when, whenever that indicator is above 70, then you can just decide, I want to sell, let's say 20% of what my current holdings or 30%, some, some, somewhere in there. Okay, so I think when you say top 20, it's most likely the likes of Bitcoin, right? And Ethereum it's the, it's the most largest likely. largest only, yes. Right, right. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so, Robert, in this show, in, in Project Offbeat, uh, we usually, you know, do this to really expand the, the corporate people, the ones in, in the corporate world right now, yeah. and expand their perspectives to see that there are a lot of careers out there, right? And you mentioned earlier, you're working on an exchange, right? And this founder, um, you know, approached you to help out, right? Yes. Do you suggest as well to get started in working in a crypto exchange or even, you know, in the future, if you have enough capital and knowledge, actually founding an exchange yourself, right? Um, do you think this is a good career path to go into? Um, why and or why not? Yeah, so, so good question. Um, I would not recommend founding an exchange. Uh, really? You wow. Extreme, you need an extreme amount of capital to do so. Um, oh. And, and our, you know, our... Our founder and CEO, you know, he just, I think a couple of years, years ago, IPO'd a gaming company in Singapore for something like $100 million. So I'm not wow. saying you need that much money, but you need a lot of money to, to be successful and also a very good team and understanding of the industry. Uh, but if you wanted to get started working in the industry, um, I would definitely encourage you to do so. Uh, the industry is going very fast um, and we probably need all the people we can get. Uh, most of the work is remote. And uh, if you speak English, uh, you'll have a head start on the global playing field. Um, so yeah, again, I'll, I'll share a link to the crypto skill tree, uh, just things you need to know in order to work in crypto. And then if you already know how to do something like sales or, uh, community management, uh, things like that, uh, you should be able to find a job in crypto somewhere fairly easily with some searching. 
Matt and I is already filling up our forms to apply in the <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> Right, right. I mean, you need all the people. We're here. We're here, Robert. Okay. <laughs> okay um, Robert, I think everyone's buying into the trend of uh, crypto, right? Because, you know, mm-hmm. they always say high risk, high reward. You know, you're, you're, you're able to double or triple your, your capital um, on the get-go, right? But then I guess from a crypto expert like yourself or mm-hmm. even someone that's behind an exchange like yourself, mm-hmm. right? What would be your advice to our audience, right? What would be something that they have to be very careful of and maybe debunk some misconceptions here and there, right? What are those things to watch out for uh, yeah. before really trading or really getting into this crypto space? Yeah. If the project seems sketchy, like you have a weird feeling about it, or if the team isn't doxxed, you should probably stay away. I think those are, those are some... Some, some key things, uh, you know, it's unfortunate there, there are a lot of scams um, and they'll want, you know, want, want you to give a lot of your time and effort for free. Uh, don't do that. Uh, the fastest way to start is just following good projects and people in the space on somewhere like Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. And you can go and look at our official EasyDex Twitter account to see who that account is following and follow those people. So just go to that and then just follow those people that, you know, that we have there. Uh, that should be a very good start to seeing what what uh, what is out there. Good solid stuff, not scams. Um, I'm not saying that people on that list won't post scams at some point, but that, <laughs> that list is curated by me. So you know, I, I block people. You know, sometimes when they when they post sketchy stuff, but that list is pretty good for as a start. Uh, you can also look at uh, crypto job boards uh, to vet opportunities. Um, yeah, so that's what I would recommend. Um, awesome. Do you have any tips for our audience? Let's say they do want to get into crypto, right? How would mm-hmm. they? How would you like split your portfolio? Let's say um, thirty percent in savings, something like that, or how would you recommend? Mm-hmm. So, like a crypto specific portfolio. In the mm-hmm. beginning, I would only do dollar cost averaging into an index. But if you once you feel okay with that, you feel you know very comfortable with that, I would I would slowly put more and more into something like yield farming. So you could do maybe half and half or like 60, 40, where like 60% is index, 40% is yield farming or the other way around, just depending on what you're comfortable with, what you like more. Yeah, but something like half and half. Robert, sorry. I, um, I guess if you could just explain uh, to our audience, yield farming is uh, what? Um, how, how, how can we explain it in a more? So yield farming is essentially using different uh, strategies or, or products to get a more stable return. On capital so like a more stable monthly return so you might get something like six percent or ten percent uh, a month uh from different yield farming strategies Whereas i see an index i see it's literally you're just kind of like a time deposit something like that yeah though most yeah. of these products do not have time locks um though some of these projects and it's moving in this direction they have higher rewards the longer that you put the money in so like the the, the amount that you get as a reward scales with time to, you know, mm, to, to help the I project see. so um but yeah something maybe half and half between those but i would start with indexing first mm-hmm. because the problem with yield farming is you may get too excited and do a lot of projects and then what if you accidentally invest in a in a, in a bad project and it and it quote unquote rugs like the, the let's say like the protocol uh someone is, is hacked or whatever so i would do indexing first it's much safer i think Right. Um, right. before before you get to the next question though i guess this is a question for those who are afraid of like crypto coins that Mm -hmm. suddenly like fall or something. How would you know uh, if a project is going to fall? Because we talked about when you would keep or sell if it's being overbought, right? But how do you know if it's going to be uh, approaching a cliff and it's going to go for a free fall? Yeah, so uh, I I use one indicator for that. Um, It's a, okay, you you could essentially use two EMA, it's exponential moving averages uh, to watch. One is the 50, one is the 10, so 10 day and 50 day. Mm -hmm. When the uh, 10 day moving average closes below the 50 day moving average, it it will probably drop off a lot. Like that's like, that's signaling that, you know, the uptrend is over. Robert, do you guys have any plans uh, for EasyDex in the future? Are you guys developing something new, right? For our audience today who are listening, maybe they can get a first look 
you know, when they listen to this episode, you know, they can bite on it or it, they can like buy coins before it even pumps, right? Do you guys have any uh, insider uh, tips for our audience uh, regarding any easy dex developments? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, we're we're uh, doing some cool NFT you know giveaways on Discord, so that's some some free alpha, you know, at least yeah. for now. Um, and then also, we actually just finished developing a new product called uh, Swap Hunter that uh, basically helps you find low market cap gems on Uniswap and then sends them directly to your wallet, and you can participate with as little as 100 US dollars. Um, very cool product. It basically levels the playing field because you know most of the low cap gems uh, on Uniswap are just being bought by whales with you know AI tools that are watching 24 um, seven. And so we basically give that to you essentially you know for free almost. Uh, we, we don't charge that much for that product. Um, so yeah, we're launching that very soon, probably mm -hmm. Monday. So Sorry, Swap hand, Hunter? Swap? Yeah, swap Hunter, S yeah. S-W-A-P. Yes. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Thanks, thanks for that tip. Um, <laughs> we better use it right now, okay. Um, now, Robert, we're off to the most interesting part of our um, episodes here in Offbeat, right? We have this thing called the big questions, right? So okay. for our audience, um, I, I'm sure you've, you guys are already aware of this, right? These are the questions wherein we've prepared some hot topics, right? Wherein mm -hmm. we don't share the questions to our audience, uh, to our speaker beforehand, right? So this is uh, something that will surprise uh, Robert, hopefully, right? So um, Robert, there are some big questions right now in the crypto space and we'd like to get your thoughts on it. Is yeah. that okay? Sure. Okay. All right. So why don't we start, right? One major challenge, right, for Filipino adults um, entering into the crypto space, um, Robert, you know, investing 30,000 or 50,000 pesos or even 100,000 into it is that when they put it in that coin, um, there's not much avenues to do daily transactions with it, at least here in the Philippines yet. Yes. Right, so I'm, I, maybe there are some transactions that already accepts coins, but how many percent is that? Like zero point zero five percent, right? Um, for you, why should people invest in you know uh, cryptocurrency today when they can't even use it for daily transactions um, out there? Um, is it really more of a long term overview, or do you have any other perspective on it? Yeah, so actually, uh, you can. There, there are debit cards that I believe you can get through Plutus and other organizations. Or it's essentially a debit card, but the backing is all crypto. So you can use your crypto to pay for things. So as long wow. as it accepts a credit card, then yeah, you should be able to pay. But you can look. I mean, you can just literally Google search something like, you know, like crypto debit cards and like that. I, I believe there are several now, but it depends on which country you're in, uh, depending on uh, which ones you're going to be able to get. But you should be able to do that. So I guess the next question is, we already talked about crypto having the reputation of being very risky and kind of unpredictable, right? Um, Although you've gave us some pointers on how to uh, mitigate the risk for that, do you think the crypto space needs some government regulation? There will always be regulation. Uh, regulation is, is fine. Uh, what I want is regu regulatory clarity. So there is, actually isn't a lot of regulatory clarity, uh, mm. for example, in, in places like uh, the US. In Taiwan, it's fine, actually. Uh, Taiwan is pretty supportive, and they have uh, fairly clear you know, laws as far as uh, as far as it is now, uh, but in place in major uh, economic uh, places like you know the United States or even you know uh, the European Union or or, or even Russia, um, there isn't very clear regulatory frameworks. I think, and so we need more clarity. Regulation yeah. is fine, but there needs to be clarity and and reasonable think, regulations. Right, Robert. When you define the word clarity, right, mm -hmm. regulatory clarity, what does that even mean? Could you give us an example of a regulation where? It really, you know, defined uh, as a crypto exchange uh, person working there, right? It really helped you guys craft your services and whatnot. What do you mean by regulatory regulation uh, clarity? Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, if you followed it all uh, online, uh, Coinbase, which I believe is the largest U.S. Uh, cryptocurrency, centralized cryptocurrency exchange, uh, they've been ha having certain uh, spats online with the SEC. Right, which, which regulates uh, securities in the United States, uh, telling them very publicly online, we have asked you several times for clarity on these you know, different issues regarding you know, different crypto projects that they're working on or different coins, and you, you haven't given it. And the SEC's reply was essentially, you know, if you think something is uh, you know, like go, like crosses the line or something like that, then you just shouldldn't do it. And then their response is, you haven't given us a, a clear line. <laughs> and uh, so 
you know, whether it's borrowing and lending, so that there's borrowing and lending products, let's say in crypto now, or whether it's very clear definitions uh, for things like securities, um, you know, because actually the, uh, what is it? I forgot the, the, the actual, uh, you know, Alphabet's organization name for the, for this agency in the United States, but the one that, that uh, regulates uh, commodities, but not security. So commodities is things like, you know, like uh, metals and, you know, like rice and things like that. Um, by most definitions, most cryptos should actually be something like a, a commodity and not a security. Um, and so just, just, just more clarity about, okay, is this a commodity? Is this a, is this a security? If it is a security, what, you know, what are the, 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 the very specific guidelines, things like that? We don't have that still. So yeah, that's what I mean. I think my worry there, Robert, is what if they don't have clarity right now because they don't have the knowledge yet, right? I that, mean, that that <laughs> seems to be the real problem. I, I, right. I I don't like, for example, like ageism, but uh, you know, I, I just feel like there isn't that much uh, initiative being taken on the part of regulators to understand this exactly. industry better. Exactly. Thus, leading to. Uh, more and more problems because they're not interested in understanding it. And so they're not interested in, in creating very clear guidelines. Uh, that's going to be a problem, but it yeah. looks, but it looks like it's going, it's, it's going in a good direction. There's a, uh, I think it's Sam Bankman fried who is the founder of FTX exchange in the United States. He's a, you know, a billionaire. He's like, uh, you know, very, very young, 30 or something like that. Um, and he recently, I think within the last month went to, you know, the government in the U S uh, to testify, I think in, in front of Congress, uh, mm -hmm. about you know cryptocurrencies and things like that and trying to ask for you know better better regulation better thoughts on this so i i i'm optimistic i, I think you know it will go in a good direction and we'll have better clarity but you know we'll, we'll see uh, i did like a quick search on the commodity on the governing body for commodities yes. i think it's called the cftc yeah cftc right okay okay yeah. Yeah, the CFTC is, is like in a battle with the SEC about, you know, which which one is the actual regulator of cryptocurrencies. It's just, it's, you know, it's not, it's not fun. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, looking back at like the past few years or months even, there, there has been a boom in crypto, especially with regards to NFTs. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of want to talk about that more. Uh, sure. There's been a lot of controversy, blockchain, but especially on NFTs, right? not exactly being environmentally friendly. Um, there's also some issues about it, about um, artists not being able to control their work. And um, I think recently there's been a lot of like people just stealing profile pictures and just <laughs> selling it as NFTs, something like that. Um, what's your stand on this issue? Like, do you think NFTs are, um, you know, environmentally ethical, et cetera? Yeah, there are a lot of points there. Uh... That's a good question. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. So let, let me try to take them one at a time. So um, okay. the, the environmental question is the most bizarre to me because it, it's very common. I see this all the time on Twitter and mm -hmm. I, I don't understand it also because except for with the exception of Bitcoin uh, and you don't have NFTs on Bitcoin. So it's just Bitcoin. Um, you know, Ethereum is moving to a proof of stake uh, model where you won't have Ethereum mining anymore. And so the argument is null. Like, like most of the chains where you have NFTs, I believe, are, are, are all moving to proof of stake if they aren't already proof of stake. So there, there's no, there's no, there's no cost. Like, uh, you know, as far as like electricity and things like that, it's, it's, like, it's like null, very, very super low. Um, but I still people, I still see people argue it on Twitter. So it's very weird to me. Uh, the other points, yeah. um, you know, as far as artists. Okay, so you know, one thing that uh, you know we're trying to do. Uh, on, a, on a smaller scale, you know, I'll be on a smaller sure. scale is, uh, you know, make sure that any artists that, uh, that we work with um, to release NFTs, uh, which we are looking at right now, uh, mm -hmm. that they're able to receive uh, not only payment for, let's say, uh, you know, selling of NFTs through us, but also have royalties. So this is actually something that's really cool with NFTs as compared, as compared to the, like the normal art world or uh, the art world outside of crypto, which is that on, on NFT exchanges like OpenSea, you can basically set up uh, NFTs to give royalties in perpetuity to the original artists, like 5% or 10% per transaction, like each time it's bought and sold. Um, and you can set that up. Whereas like, you know, right now in like the normal art world, that's like, you, you might be able to contract that out, but there's just so much friction. Whereas in the mm -hmm. NFT world, if you like an NFT, you know, you buy it from this artist, 
you know, that they get the money from the original sale. And then also they might get, you know, 5%, 10% in royalties every time it's bought and sold in the future. So it can actually, each artwork can become like a, you know, like an income stream. So it's actually very positive for artists. I, it's, it's, it's definitely not negative for artists. It's very positive for artists, especially niche artists, I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, Robert, we're off to our last uh, big question for today, right? Um, imagine uh, you're in front of an experienced crypto trader, right? Okay. So maybe me and Matt, uh, just for example, <laughs> right? For visualization purposes, right? Yeah, sure. uh, you know, how would you persuade us to try out Easy Dex over the likes of Binance, PDAX, Coinbase, and all the other exchanges. Why should we go uh, through Easy Dex and not through these other um, exchanges? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you want ultimately. Do you want safety or do you want all of your assets on a centralized exchange that could go down anytime or get hacked? Um, as far as actual you know, points to try to convince someone to come, uh, it would be the different DeFi products that that we have. So right now we have Swap Hunter, which we're releasing, you know, very soon, just a couple of days. Where normally, if you want to, you know, scoop up those, you know, low market cap gems, you have to watch by yourself the market twenty four seven, and you also have a lot of psychological problems, which is, uh, you know, how do you determine that this low cap gem is a gem and it's not just going to go to zero, right? There are also some other technical things where, whenever you're looking at these gems, uh, <clears throat> this is more technical, but is worth is worth mentioning, which is that when you go to try to swap for them, you have to approve the contract to swap, and that costs Ethereum gas, and it's very expensive. So that's the first part. The second part is when you actually swap, the swap itself costs way more than a normal transaction, like you're just sending funds, and so you constantly in the back of your mind are like just judging yourself. It's a psychological battle. Is it worth trying to ape into this coin? Let's say on Uniswap that just launched with, within let's say a week, two weeks, but then has has momentum behind it. <clears throat> that might do the 10x, 100x, 1000x, right? Um, we take all of that away. If you use Swap Hunter, you don't have to pay the approval fee. You don't have to pay the swap fee. You just put however much you want to however much you want to put into these low cap coins, and we take care of that all of that for you, and then send them directly to your wallet, and you choose what you want to do with them. And you want to set your profit targets, you know, as high as you want, 10x, 100x, you know that. That's for you to decide, but we take up take care of everything else for you. So it takes away all of that psychological burden and also most of the fees. It's, 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 we pay, I think, 70, 80% of the fees that you would have paid by yourself. Uh, and then as far as other DeFi products, our goal is to aggregate all the best DeFi products in one space, in one wallet that is protected and is in your hands so that you can use and see and manage all the best DeFi products in one place. You don't have to go to this page and then this page and then this page and then this product just to manage all of your things. You can do it all on one page in your own wallet. Wow. Wow. Would you be selling uh, NFT soon in your exchange as well? I, I think when I checked your website mm -hmm. right now, I think these are mostly coins, uh, but mm -hmm. how about NFT art projects, you know, the social yes. tokens and, and the like? Yeah. We, so we'll be selling uh, NFTs, but that's not like a major part of the business. This is more, uh, you know, like contracting with, with different artists and, you know, giving them, uh, and also our community, some, 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 some cool stuff, you know, uh, and opportunities just for artists to, to, to get a, a broader our audience, you know, so we'll be selling NFTs, but it's, it's not like, uh, and they won't be, they won't be very expensive. So you don't have to worry. Um, you know, if you are interested in buying them, uh, but awesome. it's more of a fun thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, question is easy considering developing their own coin as well. Yeah. So, so we have our own uh, token, EasyX, uh, which okay. is right now representing the coin. Uh, once we launch our own blockchain uh, this year, you will be able to switch your EasyX ERC20 tokens on Ethereum to the, the, the native token for our chain, also EasyX. So you'll be able to bridge it over. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Um, I think that's about it, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today in our episode here in Project Offbeat. Um, Robert, your career is truly an offbeaten path, right? From a translator who loves history, you know, you've done you've shared to us in just one hour so many history lessons in China and whatnot, right? And now you're here preaching and, and educating people about this crypto space, right? And what I love about it, right, was that. You don't just talk about it and, and describe it the way, you know, websites does, right? You try to connect the dots 
coming from history and now how we're into this crypto space right now. Um, we truly, truly appreciate your your inputs. Uh, we'd love to have you again back in, in our show, right? Um, I guess for now, uh, let us know uh, where you are right now and what you're excited about, anything that you'd like to share our audience. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, main thing we're excited about uh, today is launching our new product, uh, Swap Hunter. Uh, you'll be able to find it directly on our site on easynext.market, uh, or you can just go to our Twitter or Discord to find the link. It's just a great way for normal people to be able to find low cap gems on Uniswap without having to spend countless hours researching and watching the markets by themselves. Um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And, and for our audience who were like, you know, impressed by you, how can they contact you? Right. I think you mentioned earlier to join easy deck discord community. Yes. How about personally contacting Robert? Is that, you know, a thing? Yeah, sure. So, uh, two main ways, like you mentioned, you can just go to discord. You could probably just at me on discord. <laughs> and then a uh, second way, which is maybe better and more professional is that you feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Um, and, and as long as you don't spam me, you know, I'm happy to help with any questions that you have about the space. Yeah. Feel free to add me. On LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. And then of course, last question, and it's similar to all of our guests, Robert, what for you is offbeat? What for you is taking the offbeat and path, right? Um, how do you think of, you know, these movement of taking the offbeat and path? Uh, first I would say taking the offbeat and path is definitely worth it. Um, but my, my advice I guess would be, you know, don't, don't just, don't just quit your day job, like immediately, uh, you know, <laughs> first, first take some free time that you do have, uh, to just study and research, you know, what you might want to do, um, you know, take small incremental steps, uh, to see if it's something you really want to do. You know, uh, lots of people, uh, preach just going after your passion or something like that, which is great. Uh, but yes, please take small incre incremental steps first. Uh, uh, you may find out that, you know, something you thought you were passionate about, uh, is actually something you maybe aren't interested in doing long term. Um, so take small steps uh, to figure out what it is, and you know once you find something that you're excited about, that you're good at, and that the market needs, you know keep keep doubling down as that starts working for you. Um, and uh, I don't think you'll regret it. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Oh wow. <laughs> wow. Okay, uh, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today in uh, our episode. Uh, for our audience, if you'd like to hear more of these stories, please follow us in Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're everywhere, right? And of course, don't forget to also follow EasyDex in Discord, in LinkedIn, in Twitter, and so that you can catch more of Robert and his um, episodes and webinars. Thanks, Q, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you.